I'm not an attorney or an accountant. I'm giving advice based on experience, successes. I don't claim anything. This presentation is legal, state advice, tax advice. Please feel free to check with any of the techniques I ever discuss with you. This is a little chart I put up all the time. It's Phil's house. This is my house. Don't try to buy it. Okay, this is mine. All right, so let's start with, the, with some of the benefits of real estate. First of all, the one on the bottom, security, right? Keeps you from being homeless. If you have a house, you're not homeless. That's pretty good. That's a good start in life. That's a place I'd like to make sure I'm never homeless. Right? So security. It's also the section that Colin lives in, in Eric's house. <laughs> it's the basement, right? Right. <laughs> you're not homeless. You're in the basement, that's all. You're, you're working your way up, you know? Okay, so what else can you do with a house? You can use it. How about that? Like you can live in it, right? If you don't want to live in it, that's cool, because you can sell the, le the use to somebody else in the form of rent. So these are just some of the benefits that we can use real estate for, and I like to talk about it all the time, because I think it's really important. Most people, what do they do with a house? They either live in it, or they're buying and, and selling it or something, but they miss out on a lot of the other opportunities. Renting out a house is a great way to make some money. Have somebody else be paying your mortgage payment and a bunch of cash on top of it, hopefully. And what an amazing thing that is. Just to wrap your head around that for a minute. I just rented a house. Right now, everyone knows that there's no inventory out there, right? So there's no houses to buy. There's no houses to rent. So when I went to put this, this house in East Norriton up for rent, my payment was 850 bucks a month. So I just decided I, I put the rent up for 2400 I had a number of people, I just picked the number and said 2400 that's good, you know. See how much I can make. So 1850 I mean I'm making 550 bucks a month, right? I had a number of people call me up and go, you're crazy, man. You can't rent no houses in this neighborhood. Well, first of all, who makes the rules? Does the neighborhood have a committee that sets the rent? No. Do I care if my neighbor's renting the house for $1,500, $1,200? That just makes him the dumbest guy on the block. I don't care. I have always in my career consistently got more rent money. Why? Because I had the guts to try. There's, you can't go to some website and say, show me all the rents in this neighborhood. I mean, they got like Rent-O-Meter, which is one that gives you a ballpark idea, but I don't even know how they, uh, how they, how, how they even know that information, right? So you just pop in this market where you know there's nothing for rent. My house is highly desired. I just know that because of the environment. So I put a big number on it, and now I'm going to get 550 bucks a month Plus, they're paying my mortgage payment. It's a good deal for me, okay? And by the way, I bought the house subject too, so I didn't even put up any money really to buy it. They were 15 grand behind. I had to put that up, but now that 15 grand is just sitting there in equity. All right, it comes with a mortgage when you buy a house subject too. So I'm getting the amortization, all right? Now that's not much. The guy has a 30-year mortgage and his payments are 1850 so I'm probably getting like another 20 bucks or 40 bucks a month from the payments that are being made. But who gets that equity? I do. That's coming to me. And this, to me, this house, when this is an excellent house, I don't have a picture of it in this presentation, but my East Norton house that I just bought is in terrific shape, and I don't have a care in the world about this house. So I want to almost like just set it and forget I even own it. I'm going to print out invoices every month for $2,400, send it to the tenants, collect my rent money, pay the mortgage payment, and it just 10 years from now, I'll probably be up $150,000 by the time this thing's done. Not only will I have equity in the house, plus I'm getting principal pay down with the mortgage payment, but the values, it's a really strong area, and I just see the values going up. Okay, so what else do you get from real estate? You get tax benefits. 
I do presentations on how you can use the 1031 exchange program with your investment properties, right? And you can sell your investment properties and then take that money and roll it into another property. And, and that is an amazing tax benefit. This is one of the tax benefits that you get from real estate. How about depreciation? It's a phantom write-off. It's not a real write-off. You're not actually, your house value is not going down 1 27th of its value every year. It's going up in value. But the government, in its wisdom, allows you to write off a phantom loss. And if you have a bunch of properties, like I have, or Larry has, you get to write off a depreciation 1 27th of every house you own. It becomes huge. Okay? And if you're making a bunch of money, that comes in really handy. So like in stock options, for example, a lot of us in here are killing it. The people who are really experienced, we're making a lot of money from just stock options and real estate. But just the stock options alone, you're sitting there, yeah, you can put your money in your Roth IRA, your traditional IRA, but that's just not enough. Because we're making more than that, way more than that, and we need to have places to write it off. Well, owning real estate gives you more and more ways to have tax benefits from the money you're making. Now, management is the thing most people hate. And if I find out that anybody in here buys their first investment property and they hire a property manager, you're in big trouble with me. You can manage in your spare time two dozen houses easy before you need, even need to think about a property manager. I mean, unless you own something that's huge and, and it's in Florida or somewhere far from here, that gets a little more complicated than maybe you could maybe you could work something out in that scenario where you need a manager. But if you're talking a bunch of single family homes or duplexes and stuff, yeah, no way. I mean, you could easily do 30 houses, 35 houses. It's a part-time job for you. All right. Income. The income that I'm getting from the East Norton house is whatever I'm getting above the mortgage payment, 550 bucks. Will I have to kick some of that money back? Sure. If something goes wrong with the house and it has to be fixed, I, I have to pay for that, right? But I got a business partner who's a construction guy. So I physically won't be going there. I'll just be calling him and saying, yo dude, send one of your people over to the house to do whatever, right? And, and I'm basically, free. I'm more or less, when I say I'm the manager, you're not going to see me over there with a hammer and a drill, although I'm capable of doing that. I don't really do that kind of thing much anymore these days. I would call my business partner, who is the guy, Shane, who I ran a wholesale business with. And this East Norton house is just another property that came up over the course of a couple of years that we worked together. And it's in our portfolio now. And that's it. Okay, profits. So I already told you about income. Income, of course, and profits are a little different. So profits in this chart represents if I sold the house, the money I would get from the sale of that house, that's all profits, or if I refi the house. If you refi a house and you refi it for, maybe I wait five years and I refi this house and I don't know why I would do that since it's a subject too, but if you ever do that, all the money you get from a refi is also tax-free. Why is it tax-free? Because it's a loan. It's a loan. So say you got another property you want to buy. You can go refi one of your existing properties and maybe pull 50 grand out, 75 grand out. Maybe you got to wait five years. Maybe you got to wait seven years. These are wonderful things that you can use a piece of real estate for. Imagine if you had 25 houses that you accumulated over the next five years. That's a very possible goal for somebody, okay? And if you could do that, it's like having a bunch of chips on a poker table. You've got so many options. Hmm, thinking about buying this thing. What could I do? You look at your properties, figure out which ones you could maybe sell or which ones you could refi. Yes, Jamie. 
how long do you have, like, what, does it say in your terms of the loan how long you have to wait to pull the money out for the refinance, for the loan portion of it? You, you, you would have to initiate a new loan in order to refi a property. So, for example, no, I mean the equity. Like you were saying, you could pull that. You money could out. probably do it right now, okay. if you wanted to. If you wanted to, yeah. I don't it, know how much they will let you take out. But do they give you that in the terms when you get the loan, or is that something you have to? Call I never about? got a loan. This house I bought subject to, and I just took okay. over the loan. So I, I have the authority to speak to the mortgage company. That's part of the paperwork that we have when you do a subject to deal. When you take over the m mortgage payments. You ask for access to the website, the security passwords, stuff like that. You know, when they ask you questions like what's your mother's maiden name and all mm -hmm. that stuff, I had to get all that in writing so I could go on the website. And uh, I had first thing I did was I went on the website and I had the mortgage payments for the East Norton house come to my address. It comes in the existing seller's, uh, the previous loan holder's name, but he's down in Hilton Head now. So now it com the mail comes to my house in his name to my address, and I just pay the bills. I like getting the paper statements. You know, it's just good to have the reminders, stuff like that. So, but you could probably refi your house anytime you want. I'd recommend waiting a couple of years, and then maybe it'll be worth it for you. You don't want to do it to get a small amount. So what else do you get in real estate? You get growth, okay? So if you, if, if you look back to like 1929 when, uh, uh, when the stock market crashed in 1929. You go from 1929 to 2008 when the market also had a very severe crash. The average price of real estate went up 7% a year over the course of 1929 to 2008. All right? If you look on different websites, you'll get different charts that have some tweaks on the numbers, but basically, 7% a year. It's like gravy, okay? You just buy a house, you're, if you're living in it, you're getting the use of the house anyway, so who cares? This is more bonus on top of it. If it's a rental property, it's even better because you're not even paying it. Somebody else is paying your mortgage payment plus the cash flow, plus you get the tax write-offs, plus you get the amortization. It's a great deal. Does it come in smaller amounts of money, in smaller amounts of income? and it takes longer for you to benefit from it. It's not like stock options where you can make 10 grand in a week and a half, right? It takes longer, it's a little slower. It, you gotta be more patient if you're gonna be a real estate investor. But the wealth is almost guaranteed, okay? It's almost guaranteed. Even after 2008, <coughs> I tell people all the time, I got into business in 1989, and between the years of 1989 and 2008, I got approved for every single loan I ever applied for. And frankly, as long as you could fog a mirror, you were good enough to get the loan. You would get a loan from anybody. And the guy that I worked with, he had an entire filing cabinet filled with my deals. Go ahead. So. I filled a whole filing cabinet of the deals that I was doing uh, uh, up to that point. I have a question for like new people that's trying to get into real estate. Um, do you recommend us waiting a while? Because it seems like the houses, especially in Philadelphia, is like skyrocket. It's not really worth the um, price they're asking for. There's still deals out there, but you got to work harder to find them right now. Um, when the market corrects, things will get easier, but we're not there yet. Okay. And we're probably not going to be there for a little while. All right, so let's move on. Okay, so some of the things in this presentation that I'm doing tonight, what I'm trying to do is tell people who want to be real estate investors some things you need to know. It's one of the reasons I just went over that chart. Okay, if you're, what you should do is go out and buy a website. If you're going to be a real estate investor, if you've made up your mind you're going to be a real estate investor for the rest of your life, you should go on to say GoDaddy and find some cool name to buy a website of. For example, this one is called SellYourHouseNow.com, okay? And what you need to do is get a software program that runs in the background 
okay, which captures people's names and emails. You've probably heard of Constant Contact, uh, A. Weber, right? MailChimp. There's dozens of them. These companies, they have these opt-in boxes, okay? These opt-in boxes, this is a site to capture sellers' leads, all right? So what you want to do on a site like this, and the first thing that you want to do is you have to go into the software. For example, if you're using AWeber, you can go in there and they have a bunch of different opt-in boxes. And you have to find one that you like and put it on your website, okay? And you might need the help of a web designer if you're not real savvy on creating your own website. And then what you could do is you got to give away something free. You got to give people an additional reason besides just being on your seller's list. This would be a seller's list, right? You're trying to generate seller leads. You got to give them away something free. So here, there's a report and it says, the fastest way to sell your house in any condition, right? So what do you do? Write a couple pages about the fastest way to sell your house in any condition, okay? That's one way you can do it. You probably can find a book that has something like that in it and you can use it. And what you're hoping to do is a seller is going to come to your website, put their name and email address in that they want to get an offer today to sell their house. If you could develop a site that generated leads for you, even if you only got one a month, okay, you'll probably buy two of those houses in a year. Okay? So, and if you know how to do things to, cr to generate people to go to your website better, right? spending a little bit of money, marketing your website, putting stuff. Jamie found the house she lives in by going on Facebook and writing, I buy houses. <laughs> okay? It sometimes it doesn't take a whole lot, right? You could go to Facebook every day and put a post on your page and get your friends and family to put posts on their pages, driving people to a website called Sell Your House Now. And maybe you'd get more than just a couple leads a year. And if you knew how to, uh, you know, all the things that drive people to your website, that would be another way that you could do it. So what do you want to do? You, you got to buy a domain name. You got to get it set up somehow. If you don't know how to do it yourself, you got to pay somebody to do it, okay? You got to offer like a free report or something. Give them something, okay? Um, another thing you can do is you can have a blog page on this website where you're blogging, and if this is us, you're trying to generate seller leads. So you want to put stories on there that a seller would be interested in. Like, one of the best ways to get your house out of foreclosure. One of the, the top five ideas to get rid of hoarder's trash in your house. Um, Things of that nature. Stories that somebody who, people who are selling their house are usually behind in their mortgage. They have a house that needs a great deal of repair and they don't have the money to fix it. So you want to write stories in your blog page about those kind of things and maybe, and post them on Facebook, for example, would be one way. And maybe somebody who's struggling with their house will contact you if they feel like you're genuine and you're going to help them, okay? If you do get a lead on your website, it should be set up to give you immediate notification via text, via email, any way you can do it. And what do you want to do with that lead? You want to capture those leads and you want to call those people immediately. And what do you want to do on the phone? You're not going to buy someone's house on the phone. That's not going to happen. You're going to call the person up and you're going to say, can I book an appointment with you? I'm going to be in your area actually tomorrow at, 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 in the afternoon around 2 o'clock. Does that work for you? If they think you're going to be in the area, that helps sometimes to, be, to get them to book an appointment. And if they ask you some questions about how does this whole thing work, this is a question you'll hear a lot of times from sellers. How does this work? I'm going to stop by your house. I'm going to do a quick tour of the outside, a quick tour of the inside. I'm going to come in, I'm going to analyze what kind of repairs your house needs, and I'm going to make an offer on the spot. Now, that might not be so easy for you if you're new in the business, but trust me, if you do this often enough, it will become very easy. So what do I do? I'm going to get into that in a minute. 
I booked the appointment. My goal is one thing and one thing only. I want to get this house under contract. As I always say, if you don't get the house under contract, you have nothing. You've left with nothing. You maybe you have a little something. You, you, you didn't meet a seller. You talked to that seller. They didn't go for it, but they might go for it later. So if anything, you keep their information and you call them once a week for a while until they tell you to go pound sand. And then you know you're probably not going to do business with them. All right? And, you, and if you can get that house under contract, now all you got to do is go find a buyer. Okay? So if Scott was the seller who was selling me his house, I get his house under contract. Okay? And then Ken... I met him at investor schooling, and I know he's got money, and he's looking for a real estate deal to buy. I would take a bunch of pictures of the house. I would take a video of the house. I would call Ken, and I would try to sell him this house and cut in for myself a ten to $15,000 spread, at least. And this is called wholesaling, and we do it all the time. But it doesn't mean you have to wholesale it. You could keep it. You could put it in your portfolio, which, in my opinion, is always the best way but sometimes when you need money, you got to do what you got to do, right? All right, let's keep moving. So, if I got an appointment with somebody, I know I'm going to see him tomorrow. I'm a realtor in the state of Pennsylvania. The first thing I'm going to do is run comps. And I want to determine what the ARV is. ARV stands for uh, uh, after repair value. What this, I don't care that the bathroom looks like this right now. I'm going to rip it out anyway, all right? What I want to know before I go on this appointment is what the after repair value of the houses in this neighborhood are worth, whatever that number is, okay? And you do not print out the comps and bring them to the house like a realtor would do with the papers in your hand because there may be some information in those papers you don't want to share with the seller. So what I do is I email the comps to myself and I'll pull out my phone and if I need to refer to those comps, I pull out my phone and I look at it on my phone. And I say, just give me a minute, Mr. Seller. I, I, I need to just think about my offer, right? So when I, f when I get to the house, first thing I'm doing is I take a quick tour of the outside, a quick tour of the inside. And because I've been in this business for 32 years, I could walk through a house and I have a pretty good idea about how much money it's going to cost to fix. And do I, do I inflate those numbers? Absolutely. I inflate the repair numbers, okay? If I think it's 25, uh, I'm saying 35, okay? I pad it a little bit. I got to protect myself. I can't be going around buying people's houses and not making any money. All of this costs money, all these things we're talking about. So I'm going to, while I'm walking around the house, I'm going to estimate the repairs right when I'm there. Now, if you don't know how to invest, um, estimate repairs, I totally get it. One way you can learn is by spending time going through Lowe's or Home Depot, walking around, seeing what things cost, right? Talk to contractors. If you've got any contractors who are friends, maybe he can help you, okay? Billy in the back of the room is a great contractor. He's a guy who could help you, all right? Billy even did a presentation for the school on how to estimate repairs on houses. You should watch that video. It's a good video, okay? You even, Lowe's and Home Depot have software programs that you can use and the software programs are designed to help their clients who are using, who want to use Lowe's, for example, to add up how many windows they want, how many kitchen cabinets, and all that stuff, and it will estimate it with great accuracy. So you can actually use, you could bring an iPad with you, or your cell phone, or a laptop to an appointment, and you can start adding up the actual cost. Now the seller might be like, hey dude, uh, <coughs> you've been here for like an hour and a half, when are you going to tell me what the offer is, right? I do it in my head. I realize not everyone can do that, but, but you get the point. So, the most important thing on this slide is that formula up there, okay? So the formula is MAU, okay? It's maximum allowable offer. Maximum allowable offer that you're going to make on a house, this formula, you want to write this down, okay? So MAU equals the ARV, the after repaired value, times 0.70%, okay? And what I'm doing is I'm padding my offer with 30% profit for me, okay? Minus the repairs, okay? So you have to guess at the repairs, 
It's common sense. I don't think you, you got to be a construction genius to figure this out. You know, you might screw up a few of them. Okay, that screwing up is how humans learn. When I was a little kid, I hit my head on a coffee table. I learned to stay away from the coffee table. Okay? All right, so I'll show you. This is an example of a formula that I might do at someone's house. So the ARV for the house is $100,000, okay? This house is pretty messed up. That picture of that ugly bathroom, that's in this house, all right? So I used 0.65 instead of 0.70. I, I put an extra 5% of padding in there because I'm concerned about the extensive repairs that this house needs, okay? That would be one reason you might want to do it. But in, in this formula, the repairs are only $10,000. So $100,000 times 0.65 is $65,000 minus 10,000 in repairs. Your maximum allowable offer is 55000 Now, if a seller says, and this is what you're going to hear, uh, 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 my, my neighbor three doors down, he sold his house for eighty grand. There's no way I'm selling your house. I said, eighty grand, huh? That's what you heard? Um, because I ran the comps. And I didn't see your neighbor's house on the list. Now, did he sell it two, three years ago? I'm sorry, you know, typically speaking, comps, you don't want to go more than six months. Maybe you can stretch it to a year. If he sold his house three years ago, that doesn't even count. So you, you have to kind of learn, like, whatever objection they have, you, you need to have some kind of objection handling to deal with this if you're in somebody's house. But these calculations like this, you can just do this on your phone. It's no big deal. Okay, let's talk a little bit about cap rates. Now, when you start getting into, you don't really use cap rates on residential homes. All you really need to know is the maximum allowable offer. You need to know the ARV. You need to know what the, how to come up with the maximum allowable offer and make bids and negotiate, okay? So if you're a wholesaler, for example, you're not even going to fix that house, right? So you, your biggest thing is just get it under contract, even if you got to pay more than you want to pay for it. So I say it's a maximum allowable offer, but I say I would also tweak that maximum allowable offer if I could walk out of there with a contract, because I still might be able to sell it to somebody. Maybe I won't get 15 grand, but maybe I'll get seven. I'll take that, okay? I've taken wholesale fees as little as $1,000, all right? So, and most I've made was in six figures. So th this game, it's, it's a game of locking up people's properties, okay? And then trying to sell the property. If in the event you can't find a buyer for the property, you can always back out of the deal and just say, you know what, I decided I'm not gonna buy it. It happens all the time in real estate. Plenty of deals never get closed. All right, so in the commercial arena, say you wanna buy a commercial. Robin's looking at a commercial property right now. You need to understand cap rates. Okay, it's a very simple formula, okay? So what you need to do is you need to know your net operating income, all right? Your net operating income is pretty simple. It's all, if you look at this drawing, okay, this big fat pipe coming from the top, what it's showing is income from the tenants, income from amenities. Amenities could be a washer dryer room, it could be vending machines, it could be anything. And some other income. What could the other income be? Uh, you got a cell phone tower on the top of the building. And you got income coming from that too. So you got three different ways of income that is fueling that big fat pipe in the middle that's gross revenue. And see that bucket down at the bottom? That's what you're going to get. Okay? The pipes that are coming out the side are expenses. So net operating income, which is the rent roll, minus the operating expenses. It's super simple. So in this scenario, we got management fees, we got repairs, we got maintenance, we got utilities, and we got other costs, whatever they may be, okay? So you get down to a number, and that number, that NOI, net operating income, is the number you're going to use to determine the value of this building. So in this case, this is my office building Executex Suites like my friend Jim over here, who owns some office buildings, okay? So this building was for sale for 2.3 million. And at the time, uh, <coughs> I just did a simple cap rate calculation, okay? 
they told me that the building, they put out a memorandum, and this memorandum said that it's a 12.5% cap. The higher the cap, the more money you're supposed to make. Theoretically, what a cap m rate means to a buyer is that you should get approximately 12.5% on your money for buying this property, all right? So how do, you, how do you double check this stuff, okay? You take the net operating income divided by the sales price, that gives you the cap rate, okay? So in this scenario, I had all the numbers for the building. I hadn't bought it yet, but I was intending to buy it. And the seller shared with me all the information I needed. They had a rent roll of 42,000 bucks a month at the time I bought it. Bottom line was my, my net operating income came out to be $268,000. If you divide that number by the sales price, it comes out to 0.1247 or a 12.5% cap. Go ahead. Do you have a question? Oh, I thought you raised your hand. All right. Okay, don't scratch your head. Knock that off. Okay, so <coughs> there's also what, what, what they call a local cap rate, okay? If you think of local cap rates, it, it, it's kind of like a comps in a way. So if I'm buying this building in Huntington Valley, that's where it's located, and I'm buying it with a 12.5% cap, but most of the other office buildings in the area are selling for 8% cap, there's an argument, you know, for my building might be an 8% cap. So this is the kind of stuff you want to look at, all right? If you took the net operating income and divided it by uh, an 8 cap, it actually means that the building would be worth a lot more money, like 3.3 million, okay? So what did this show me? It showed me that I might be buying a building that's underpriced. Yeah, yeah. that's what I wanted to ask you. You would use the cap rate to determine whether you're overpaying for a building? You're, you're trying to obtain as much knowledge as you can from a cap rate calculation. It's not an ingenious, it's, it's just a formula on, on a computer or on your phone. So you can't base your entire decision off of that, okay? So if you have the cap rate of the market and cap rate of the deal, um, is it always good to have a higher cap rate of the market, of your deal, higher yeah. than the cap rate of the if market. If you see a retail apartment building today listed for sale, mm. the cap rate is probably like a five, mm. all right, which, th which is not very good. You want that number to be higher, higher, okay? Here's a quick calculation that you can do if you're ever looking at a commercial piece of real estate. Find out what the net operating income is and multiply it by 10. It's, a, it's a not a very scientific number, but you can very quickly decide what a property is worth. If Using that formula based on my 268,000, that means that uh, the building would have been worth $2.6 million, right? Now, do I put a ton of weight in that? No, but this is things that real estate investors need to know. You need to be able, if you're gonna go out and look at houses, you need to know what to offer. I gave you the formula, the Mao formula. You sh it's super simple, anybody can do it. If you're looking at commercial properties, you need to kind of use the cap rate formula. It doesn't take a genius to figure this stuff out. It's pretty easy. And these are the kind of things that you need to be thinking about. This, this video will be up on the website. If you forget the formulas, you can just refer to it and you're gonna remember it because it's not too complicated, all right? There's also a way to calculate like your own personal cap rate. This has more to do with the financing. So basically, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I'm not trying to confuse anybody, all right? But you can, if you got an 80% mortgage at 7% interest, you simply multiply 0 0.07 times the 80% gives you 5.6. Then the, let's just say that you didn't have the down payment. You needed 20% down payment, but you didn't have it. So you borrowed it off of a private lender and a private lender's charging you 15% on your money, okay? You multiply that, it comes out to 3.0. You add those two numbers together, you come up with a cap rate of 8.6. Why is that important? Because it refers directly to the money you borrowed, what rate you borrowed it at. So you can actually come up with your own personal cap rate. You can forget about what the buildings in town are selling for. You can forget about that. You could even forget about the 10 times 10 valuation calculation. Those are just things to give you some different 
perspective. You have a few different calculations. This calculation is probably the most accurate one. And when it came out to be 8.6, okay, I thought to myself, hmm, right? That's not bad, all right? So the outside factors adjust the cap rate, depending on what kind of money you borrowed. These are just some simple things that you guys can use if you're thinking about buying some real estate. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> who was the guy who did that? Horshack. Yeah. When, uh, as far as get getting into the real estate end of things, do you recommend residential or commercial? Like, I have a, an interest in commercial. There's a little place over on Buck Road in Huntington Valley. I'm I'm hoping the guy's going to come up with some finance so I could buy something like that. You better have a wheelbarrow <laughs> full of cash. <laughs> I might. I might. I, I mean, I think you should look at both. I mean, you know, in the beginning, I did nothing but residential real estate for years, okay? And then <clears throat> I kind of got, it's a very natural progression for a real estate investor. Once you've bought a dozen or two houses, what happens next? You want to do something bigger, right? You want to do something greater. You want to do something bigger like Jim over here, okay? So what do you do? Well, one of the easy, you can't go to Harvard and take a course on buying commercial real estate. They don't do that, and they're not going to teach it, okay? So what do you do? My way that I learned it was I just called the signs. So if you drive by a commercial building, there's a big wooden sign out there that says, for sale, for lease. Doesn't that sound desperate? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I don't care. Buy it, rent it. We don't care. Please call us, right? So I started calling those guys. And I'd go into a meeting with a guy, and he'd say, our building has a cam of 11. I don't know what the hell he's even talking about, yeah, right? Right. right? But I started asking him questions. Hey, what's a cam? And explain it to me. It's just another mathematical formula. There's other ones like gross rent multipliers. There's all kinds of formulas out there that geniuses try to invent, okay? So well, what did I do with the cam? The guy explained it to me. The next time I went to go see a building, I said, so, what's your cam? <laughs> right? I just learned about the shit five days ago, <laughs> but this is how you learn the business, okay? Realtors will be willing to educate you. Sellers will be willing to educate you. And let these guys do it. Let them educate you on commercial real estate. You walk around, you ask a bunch of questions. You, you inspect the building. You pretend like you're going to buy the building until you get comfortable enough that you actually feel like you know what the heck you're talking about. I used to drive my wife nuts. You know, be like Friday night and she's making some dinner plans with the family and I go, oh, I can't go. Uh, I'm just looking at this building. She's like, what building? Hey, is, this a, is this a building over here? Yeah. What building? It's like this $5 million building I'm looking at. Right? And she goes, how the hell are you going to buy that? I said, I, I don't have any intentions of buying it. I'm, I'm trying to learn about commercial real estate. And this was how I did it. Anybody can do it. And I'm telling you, okay, so you're driving around where you live. You're going to see those big signs. Let's say for sale, for lease. Call them. What the hell's a big deal? Call one a week. Call three a week. You, you'll learn real fast. Like, you'll meet these people. You'll be able to. It, it's a great way to immediately get into the business for free and learn and talk to realtors because they're going to want to show you how smart they are and they're going to try to uh, educate you. And it's all great stuff, hopefully. Yeah, they might give you a bunch of wrong information, screw you up for life. But I'm not responsible for that. 